Hey, hey, welcome back. Sports Bit Betting Insight today. Paulie and Teddy, Thursday, August 17th. Big game breakdown, the Cardinals and the Pirates. And one NFL game, Friday NFL Network. Two bet on coaches go head-to-head. -head. The Vikings and the Seahawks. Deep dive part two with Matthew Holt, CG Technology. Truths and myths of being a bookmaker. We'll get to that and play of the day. Tonight, 9 o'clock Pacific, Teddy covers with his chat. He'll answer all your questions. Teddy, looking forward to that. How's that been the last month, Teddy? I'll tell you what, I enjoy it. I enjoy it every single week uh, on Thursdays. Again, 9 o'clock Pacific, midnight on the East Coast. I got a tweet from someone asking me if we could move it earlier. I'd love to do it earlier, but the problem is Thursday night football <laughs> is going to get in the way. We want to do it on Thursday night. So it's probably going to stay at this 9 Pacific, midnight Eastern. Happy to answer any questions you send me on Twitter, of course, at Teddy underscore covers. All right, excellent. Hey, the Dodgers win again. They're on pace for 116 wins. They were down 4-2 to two in the bottom of the ninth. This is a bad beat. With the White Sox, a little bit of White Sox money as well, as it wasn't an avalanche of Dodger money. Puig with the walk-off double as the Dodgers come back with three in the ninth, Teddy. Yeah, I mean, money came in on Chicago against L.A. That's a rarity, although we've noted here on Sportsbit several times that Carlos Rodon has quite a following in the MLB marketplace. and He was sharp, man. He worked into the bottom of the eighth. He left with a 4-2 lead. But that White Sox bullpen blew it in the ninth, as you mentioned, Puig, uh, with the uh, two-run double. That was all the difference. Bad beat for White Sox betters, and they were more than usual in yesterday's action. Yeah, here's another one. The Pirates gave up the lead in the bottom of the sixth, seventh, and eighth. Brewers get out of there with a win. That was Cole on the mound, too, but six runs, that wasn't enough. 7-6 Milwaukee. Yeah, I mean, you know, they blew the the the. Brew, the Pirates bullpen blew four to three lead, five to four lead, six to five lead. George Contos gave up a dinger. Juan Nicasio gave up a dinger out of the bullpen. And when your bullpen's giving up a pair of dingers, hard to win those games. Tough beat if you had the Pirates. All right, back for the books now. Look at this move on the Marlins. Dollar sixty-five up to one ninety. They win eight to one. Matt Cain on the road, no good. I mean, look at this. The Giants have lost his last seven road starts by twenty-five runs. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they're getting killed on the run line in these Kane starts. And look, Kane doesn't have a whole lot left, uh, and he hasn't had a whole lot left. He's been okay pitching in San Fran, away from San Fran. The markets have gone nuts uh, betting against him. And, you know, we talked on yesterday's sports bit about how the Giants show professionalism when Mad Bum's on the hill. They rally from behind to win uh, for their ace the previous day. Didn't happen so much with Matt Cain on the hill yesterday. As you mentioned, his last seven road starts, they've lost by 25 runs. We're going to see money coming again against Matt Cain next time he's on the hill on the highway as well. Yes. Look at this. It was all Padres money for the entire series at home against the Phillies. They opened 120, closed 145. They went again. Richard pitched well. Can you believe that? And Will Myers stole second, third, and home in the same inning. <laughs> well, that's impressive. Look, Will Myers has not produced for San Diego the way they had hoped, but he's certainly a guy with a boatload of talent, a boatload of speed, and if he gets hot, he can spark a lineup, no question about it. But uh, the books did not enjoy <laughs> the Padres versus the Phillies. And again, a couple of last-place teams going nowhere. Who's paying attention? The wise guys are paying attention. There was steam in every single game for San Diego. They beat the Phillies by a combined 10 runs while going 3-0 and in the series. All right, the Cubs needed to have this one, and the markets came in heavy against Homer Bailey. Open 195, closed 225. Rizzo with the grand slam in the first. I guess the tough beat if you had Cubs run line as well. It was 6-1 in the, in the top of the seventh. Reds tie it. Cubs get the walk-off wild pitch. They win 7-6. to six. Yeah, and again, bad result for the house. You know, the Dodgers come back to win. The Cubs, uh, I'm not going to say come back to win, but they blew a 6-2 lead and ended up, well, you know, what's worse for a, a, a better, you know? Here's your dog. They rally all the way back, and oh, let's lose it in the bottom of the ninth on a walk-off wild pitch. Homer Bailey now sitting on an 8.44 ERA for the season. Uh, I wonder how many more times we're going to get to bet against Homer Bailey right now. Although he signed long-term, we may get plenty of more chances to bet against Homer Bailey. It's been ugly yeah. uh, for Cincinnati's one-time ace. And a 30-cent move on the Rockies. Boy, the betters knew what they were doing here. Open 155, closed 185. Rockies won 17 to 2, although the total was bet down from 11 and a half to 10 and a half. That never stood a chance. 
Yeah, I mean, the 17 to two, the game wasn't that close, Polly. <laughs> I mean, this game was was over very, very early. Uh, the books took a beating, 30 cent move on the Rockies. The public liked it, the wise guys liked it, and everybody cashed in who bet Colorado a last night bad result for the house. David Purdom, ESPN Chalk does a good job. He's also a nice follow on Twitter. He had a good uh, story on here in Las Vegas. It's nothing but Raider money to uh, week one to win the Super Bowl and to win the AFC at William Hill. They've attracted nearly twice as many bets to win the Super Bowl as any other team. I don't understand it. Even some bookmakers are saying it has nothing to do with the Raiders coming to Las Vegas in a few years. Listen, every close game went their way last year, and they were plus 16 in the turnover battle. That's not going to happen again. Yeah, uh, let's talk about the odds themselves. The Raiders in the opened in the 20-to-1 range. Uh, now they're like 6-to-1. Uh, here, let's flo- uh, flash that graphic real quick. When you have the top teams, the most bets to win the Super Bowl, they're the Raiders at number one. Behind them, the Packers, the Cowboys, the Giants, and the Steelers, all attractive choices at the Westgate. Note the fact the Patriots are not on that list. Of course, the three-to-one return uh, probably has a lot uh, to do with that. But you look at the bookmaker quotes from around town about all this Oakland money coming in. You know, uh, Chuck Esposito, quote, it's all Raiders. Uh, you know, Ed Sammons uh, from the uh, uh, Westgate the Superbook. I don't think it has anything to do with the Las Vegas angle. Last year, the Raiders pl- played really high-scoring games and they started covering spread. That's just the dynamic of a public team. We've got 82 bets on the over and 33 on the under. Essentially, the public is on the over, and the wise guys are definitely on the under on the Raiders. So we're seeing a real split here. Public loves Oakland. Wise guys, not so much. Yes, up next, big game breakdown. Good series, big series between the Cardinals and the Pirates. And we'll get to the Friday night game on NFL Network, the Vikings and the Seahawks, coming up on SportsBit. Betting Insight today on SBRPicks.com. Go to SBRodds.com. Browse, compare, and shop live odds available at top online sportsbooks. Back on SportsBit, Betting Insight today. Paulie and Teddy, time for big game breakdown. As always, sp- uh, sponsored and powered by Bet Online. Exceptional customer service, strong promotions, every type of wager we're looking for out there. Check out the bonus page, sportsbookreview.com, for the latest and best offers to open a new account today. Cardinals and the Pirates. Pirates at home, $1.35, 8.5 the total, over minus 125. Money coming in on the over as we tape, likely to be painted nine by the time you see this. Wainwright against Tyone. All head to heads for these NL Central teams in the top four down the stretch, and they're going to be crucial. Cubs with a game and a half lead over Milwaukee, two and a half over the Cardinals. Wainwright, a classic case of how short-term numbers can lie. Post-All-Star break, 2-0 with a 3-3-7 over four starts, Teddy. But that doesn't tell the full story. No, I mean, look at the first graphic here. Here's Adam Wainwright since the All-Star break. He's thrown 21.1 innings, and he's given up 28 base runners while striking out seven. Okay, it's pretty well impossible for a major league pitcher to consistently win when he's allowing four times as many base runners as strikeouts. But of course, baseball luck and savvy veteran guile uh, can allow extremes in short cycles. But when we look at Adam Wainwright this season, look at the career worst for this guy, okay? Career worst in ERA, fielding independent pitching, adjusted fielding independent pitching, Sierra, whip, base uh, walk percentage, home run to fly ball weight, swinging strike percentage, all of those, not just bad, career worst for Rainwright. Yet, he's still gone 12 and 5. St. Louis is still 14 and 8 in his starts. Let's call it what it is. A little bit of veteran guile, a little bit of luck for Adam Wainwright. He is a pitcher we can expect a significant correction from down the stretch of the MLB campaign. Yes, very good there. Nice job with the stats guy. Tyone had a worse back-to-back of his career a couple of weeks ago, allowed 18 runs in six and two-thirds innings and losses to the Giants and the Reds. Didn't hurt his confidence, though, because the last two starts, 12 innings, four runs, 11 hits, 15 strikeouts. Pirates won both, and he went 1-0 and with a no decision. The ERA went from 338 in 2016 to 4.5 this year, but the fielding independent pitching has dropped from 371 to 336. Look at that BABIP. That's unbelievable. It's 361. That's the batting average of balls in play of the 112 pitchers that have thrown 90 innings or more. 
Richard has it worse, barely at 362. We, we also, you tie it into Irvin Santana. You know, what's the average? 297? And early on, Santana was sitting there at like 2223, which is lunacy. Total luck, totally a uh, bunch of atom balls. Uh, yeah, again, there's a fair bit of luck when it comes to where does a player hit it compared to how hard he hits it. And do those, you know, do the hard hit balls fall in? Or uh, are they, you know, seeing eye singles? And obviously, uh, Tyon's been a guy who's had a problem with seeing eye singles uh, all season long. When you have a 361 Babbitt, and again, there's 112 pitcher, pitchers that have thrown at least 90 innings this year. And Tyone ranks number 11, uh, 111 in Babbitt. And the only guy that's worse, as you mentioned, Clayton Richard, barely at 362. We talked about Wainwright as a guy who's been on, on the positive end of the luck spectrum so far this season. Well, Tyon's been on the negative end of the luck spectrum spectrum this season. Therefore, in theory, we should expect his numbers to improve on the stretch, even though obviously it's been a season where uh, this young hurler has gone through a lot. We know he's got nasty stuff, as you mentioned, bouncing back nicely in his last two starts after rough outings against the Giants and the Reds post-All-Star break. All right, game number two. An online number, the only game Friday, bad job of the NFL, one Friday night game. I think there's 10 preseason games on Saturday. NFL Network, Seahawks at home to the Vikings. Seattle 3, 40 the total. You're seeing some Vikings money, and why not? Uh, Seattle minus 3, even money at some key shops. What do you do when both coaches are playing on? Zimmer and bet on. Zimmer, 13-1 and one straight up in the preseason, 12-2 and two ATS. Carroll, 29-16 and 16 straight up. In 30, 14, and 1 ATS. Wasn't pretty on offense for the Vikings against the Bills. Only 240 total yards and only one first down and three series with Bradford on the field. But Zimmer liked it. They only had three penalties. Well, I mean, you talk about the concept here. We have Zimmer bet on all the way in August. Pete Carroll bet on all the way in August. What do you do? Simple. (laughs) Either you pass the game or you dig for information. What's our job? We're looking to dig for information to see if we can find anything. You talked about Minnesota as being a team that, you know, they weren't necessarily pretty against the Bills. When you get 242 yards of uh, the total offense, when your starting uh, offense gets only one first down and three drives, you know, that's not exciting stuff. Now, Case Keenum came in and filled it was very good. You know, 11 of uh, 16, 121 yards off the bench. You know, his uh, the passing was half of all the team yards, and he's a solid number two QB for preseason. But there's this thought out there, Polly, that the Minnesota Vikings under Mike Zimmer, they really, really, really want to win these preseason games. Mike Zimmer's quote tells a little bit of a different story. Ask if these games really matter to him. It really doesn't. I don't think it's good to, I do think it's good to win. If we're playing tiddlywinks, I think it's good to win. I think the competitor part of me, it's always good. At the end of the day, does it matter? No. But I think the competitive nature of your team, especially if you've got a young team getting used to winning, that's good. I know the record, uh, and certainly strong, which you can say it doesn't really matter, but then you're 13-1 and one straight up, so give me a break. But how about Boykin, the kid from TCU, as the backup with Seattle? He's a dangerous number two, 12-15 of 15 for 189 yards and a touchdown against the Chargers, as we talked about as our keys to how you can win in the preseason. This is guy what they want, Teddy. He can take off and run and scramble and move the chains to get you some yards and touchdowns. Yeah, he sure can. But let me go back to that Zimmer quote for just one second. You know, ask specifically, does winning these games matter? And he says, quote, it really doesn't. At the end of the day, does it matter? No. So the Vikings with that, you know, very gaudy, positive, straight up preseason record, the coach is saying there's some randomness in that. And the markets, they're not saying that necessarily just yet. But obviously, you talk about Trevon Boykin uh, and a guy who you know, we've liked since his days at TCU, uh, one of the most dangerous preseason number two quarterbacks. You know, Dynamite last week versus the Chargers has that dual threat. You know, the mobility, a huge problem for defenses in August because they don't see running quarterbacks at all in camp practices. And if they do see them, they can't hit them anyway. So it really is a unique situation for defenses when you have these dual threat QBs on the field against backup defenders and third string defenders. And of course, running quarterbacks, that's a part of the Seahawks offense. So it's not like Pete Carroll is telling his QBs, don't do that in August. You know, uh, last week, the combination of Wilson, Boykin and Davis 
54 rushing yards from the quarterbacks. And, of course, the Seahawks also, they've got good depth at running back for a preseason. I mean, when you have Thomas Rawls and Eddie Lacy, the C.J. Procy, I mean, it's, a, it's really a, a deep RB group for Seattle. And none of those guys played a whole lot last week. We could see more of that trio against the Vikings on Friday night. Up next, the deep dive, part two with Matthew Holt from CG Technology here in Vegas. Teddy caught up with him at the seminar in Costa Rica. The truce and mess of bookmaking and the play of the day on Sportsbit. Betting insight today on SBRPicks.com. Research before you bet. Be sure to check out SBR Picks for the best game predictions, breakdowns, and much, much more.
Wrapping it up on Sports Fit, Betty and Inside today. Good job, Teddy, with Matthew Holt. Mayweather McGregor previews coming next week, and we'll do more of some of his interviews with everyone he caught up with. Mark Lawrence still to come next week. Money time, play of the day. Wainwright has struggled. A lot to like, maybe, with Tyon and the Pirates. Where are we going, Teddy? Yeah, let's take a look at betting number 956. We're going to lay a little bit of chalk with the Pittsburgh Pirates. Minus 135 of the prevailing number. You can find that now uh, at betonline.com. Pittsburgh, minus the short spot. Again, we have two pitchers primed for corrections in Wainwright and Tyon. Uh, let's take the one primed to go this way, <laughs> uh, Pirates. Minus 135, that's our play of the day. All right, very good. We'll see you tomorrow. There's a ton of action this weekend in the preseason. We'll go over three big games tomorrow. And, of course, bad beats, bad bets, bad for the books. Thanks for watching. Here we go. Football season on Sportsbet. Betting insight today on SBRPicks.com. Mm-hmm.